I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to see is a presentation with uh, Dell EMC and a panel of independent writers and speakers from around the world who focus on enterprise IT technology. If you'd like to see more about this, you can go to techfieldday.com. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. I want to take you through some of the features that we've added recently. So we had a question around non-disruptive upgrades. And so the answer is that from version 8 of our product going forward, we will always provide a non-disruptive upgrade path. Uh, it's a rolling upgrade path. And interestingly, um, uh, even for the protocols, so SMB v3 supports continuous availability. We'll take you through that in a moment. NFS v3 is a stateless protocol. So when you take a node down for an upgrade, the connections just fail over to other nodes in the cluster. So from the application perspective, it doesn't drop the connection. It just keeps going. You might see a minor blip in the performance as that connection moves from one cluster node to another cluster node. But it's not like the application stops, the connection doesn't drop, you just keep going. Um, so it's really nice. Now, the interesting things around this is that we asked engineering and John said, hey, uh, give us rolling upgrades going forward as just kind of a standard thing that we always do. And he kind of overshot on the delivery. He said, actually, what I'll do is I'll do you one better, which is that um, you can actually upgrade the cluster one node at a time. And as you're upgrading the cluster, you, keep, you have new capabilities that come into the cluster. So maybe new features come into the cluster. And maybe you go through on a 20 node cluster, you've upgraded 10 of them. And you say, hey, I want to try out some of the new features on those 10 nodes. You can do that in a, in a semi-upgraded state and then determine whether or not you actually like that new version of the software code. If you do, you can continue upgrading and then commit that new uh, version. Or you can say, you know what, I'm not thrilled with this. I actually want to go back. And so we provide a uh, rollback capability, which says, hey, guess what? Um, I want to back out of this. I don't like this new version. Either it's unstable for my environment or there's something about it that's just you know, not right for me. I can actually uh, uh, revert back to my old version. And that's not something that you commonly see in scale-out architectures. For certainly the ability to have kind of a mixed version where I'm trying some new features on some of the nodes is a very unique thing in the industry. I haven't seen very much of that. I don't know if you guys have. Um, so we mentioned <coughs> continuous availability. And the way that we provide continuous availability is obviously not just a rolling upgrade where the cluster stays up while you're upgrading one node at a time, but the protocols have to provide that support as well. So SMB v3 is pretty important for us as a protocol because it has uh, not just multi-channel support for high performance, but fault tolerance built into it. And the more fault tolerance that you have, the more that you can actually make sure that you have constant uptime and availability. Um, SMB v3 also has additional things like a continuous availability and witness. And what continuous availability and witness do is that because SMB is a stateful protocol, if you were to just do a, a connection drop and then move that connection over to another node, in an SMB v2 environment, for example, the client would actually have to reconnect uh, to that particular mount point. In SMB v3, all of that state is kept uh, and, and maintained across the cluster so that you can actually move a client from one node to another node and the client doesn't drop the connection, it just keeps going. Again, the performance might ebb for a moment, but you keep going. Uh, the witness capability in SMB v3 is nice in that it notices that a node has dropped. So if, suppose that you're not doing an upgrade, but suppose a node actually fails, for example, the water pipe uh, uh, breaks and basically water starts seeping down and it takes a node out. Uh, what Witness does is it instantaneously uh, determines that, oh, that connection, there, that, those clients are no longer connected to that node, and then it'll move those connections over very quickly. So you don't have to wait for some timeouts that, hey, the client's just kind of trying to talk to that node and it's not responding. It's a very fast failover capability. So it, would the Witness be responsible for d doing things like reallocating file locks? The different nodes or? Uh, that happens anyway. So we have to do that independently of witness. Okay. But what witness does is it just, it, it's, a, it's a much faster way of knowing that, oh gosh, that, that, failed. that failed. Yeah, so it's, it's a fast failover capability. But the reallocation is something that we've built into the base uh, protocol. Can you, can you logically represent the physical layout in the data center within this so that you can make sure that data is replicated across racks and those kinds of things to protect against you know, physical failure within a rack? 
Um, well, you can certainly spread a, no, uh, a cluster across racks, and in some cases, because of the capacity of that cluster, it has to be across racks. Mm -hmm. um, we've had customers who uh, have done some interesting topologies where they have uh, some nodes in kind of different racks that are in different locations, and it's sometimes it's just because of space constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, if you lose swaths of nodes at a given time, then potentially that cluster would go into either a read-only mode or a uh, for portions of the data, or the data would become unavailable uh, if it was on a number of those different nodes. Mm -hmm. But if you set up your policies correctly, it's possible that you can sustain entire um, a rack failure. Is what we tend to recommend is that you use replication as a way of actually preventing against wholesale failures as opposed to trying to use you know, kind of rack level uh, protection. Okay. Uh, with, with proper architecting, you can probably prevent against uh, most situations depending on how large your cluster is. Uh, for example, I could put a, a, two no, a three node cluster of two nodes in one rack and one node in another rack. And so if that one node rack goes down, then the two just continue operating. But if the two nodes go down, you're kind of in a, in a bad situation there. So you better replicate to another, another location because yep. you've lost quorum at that point. Um, so this is a little more about how SMBV3 works and how the witness works. I don't know if you guys want to go into the details of how this stuff actually works with the slides here. Um, and again, the, the, the point here is not to get into a, a, a a timeout situation when you actually lose connectivity, but to notice it really quickly within seconds and then fail over that connection. So NFS v4, uh, again, similar type of capability as NFS v3 in that uh, it can recover from transparently from uh, node or network failures. Now, the reason we had to do this for NFS v4 is that it's a little bit more advanced than NFS v3 and requires this capability, but NFS v3 doesn't really require any sort of uh, additional capabilities to do transparent uh, client failover just because it's a stateless protocol. So there's nothing we really have to do. It worked from day one. It's been kind of a continuous availability protocol all along. Performance management. So obviously um, we want to make sure that we provide people the ability to actually go in and see what's happening on their cluster and report back on it. This is a new capability that's gone out in the 8.0.1 version of our product. You'll see us start to enhance this capability even more. So in addition to just uh, preventing downtime and make sure, making sure the cluster is always up, which is really important to a lot of our cluster, customers these days, especially in the consolidation case, we also want to have them be able to quickly troubleshoot when there is a not just a, a full outage or a cluster you know, or, no, or client drops, we want them to actually be able to troubleshoot any sort of uh, SLA disruption. And SLAs here might not just be cluster outages, but they might be performance reductions. And so what is a performance reduction? When performance drops, the administrator gets a call and says, hey, my performance is low. Mm, it's a lot lower than usual. What's going on? How do you quickly figure out in real time what's causing that performance degradation? And so we're moving into, and this is obviously a very, a very common and very popular thing to talk about these days, but it's real-time reporting or analytics on the data itself within the cluster. And uh, how much CPU is a different process is consuming, how much resources, memory, uh, ops, uh, IOPS, cache hits, disk read writes uh, in from, uh, uh, busy state is actual process consuming. And so we'll show that information so you can see what's consuming resources in my cluster. So if I get a call in the middle of the night that says, hey, guess what, my cluster has slowed down, I can very quickly identify the root cause of what's actually slowing down the cluster. A specific job, and as we'll start to expand this capability, it mm. could be very granular in terms of the type of filters that you put in to say, hey, um, this specific application from this IP address, and so on and so forth, uh, is actually starting to cause a lot of resource contention in the cluster. We can see exactly where the resource contention is coming from. So if somebody woke up in the middle of the night, started to generate tons and tons of log data. You're trying to finish a job because you're a media entertainment house and you've got you know, a couple of weeks until production has to be done and, you, and, that, and that film has to be ready to go to theaters and somebody's bogging down the system, who is it? Uh, that's an important question you need to answer. Um, and we're going to make all those statistics available through the API and the CLI. In fact, in the latest version of our code, 
not only is every command line available through the API, but we actually provide an SDK with sample code, so Python, for example, to show you how to use that SDK and how to use that API to go and build scripting to get information that you want or to manage the cluster or what have you. So reporting, managing, all of that can be done through an API programmatically. And you get some pretty advanced customers doing some pretty interesting things. So in the uh, electronic design automation space, uh, you have uh, chip designers who are trying to keep all of their jobs running with all of their CPUs on their application servers going at 100%, fully utilized all the time. And so they basically write a lot of custom visualization and dashboards to see, you know, basically how their systems are being utilized and what nodes have more capacity and what nodes uh, have more uh, performance available to constantly make sure that they're uh, load balancing and using the system to its fullest capabilities. I'm just here for Thoughts, questions? Do you have any examples like screenshots or like a demo that you could do to show some of the statistics? Um, I can show you some of them in Inside IQ. And those, all of those statistics that we have through Inside IQ, so I'll show you as we go through into that, uh, all of those are available through the API. So what customers have said to us is, hey, I like your Inside IQ product, but in some cases I, it's, it's constraining for me because it's kind of built as a one tool for all. Uh, and so in, in, a exact, in a specific media entertainment customer or chip design customer, they may want to do very specific reporting or controls. Um, and so we give them the ability to take all of that data and pump it into, say, Grafana. And uh, I don't have the, the screenshots here, but I've seen, oh, yesterday I was looking at um, some very interesting statistics where they're showing all of the different metadata operations that are going on at any given time. They graph them. They graph them across multiple clusters, and they can see, like, when there's a performance degradation, <coughs> hey, let's go and correlate what was happening across all of the nodes in the cluster at any given time and see kind of what was happening and what caused that particular performance degradation. But you can go into, you know, you can dump this into pretty much any tool of your choice through the SDK. So if you don't want to use our Inside IQ to go and monitor, manage, and, and, and visualize your data, you could do it through any tool of your choosing. Yeah. But every, everything that is available natively is available through API. Did you like build the API first and then Build out Inside IQ on top? Uh, it actually started the other way around. We built the Inside IQ first, and then uh, we realized that very quickly that we need to APIize everything, and so we've kind of reversed it now. So all of the, what used to be command lines that went directly into the operating system and IIQ that talked directly into the operating system through command lines and through uh, its own kind of proprietary API, we put the API now as kind of a layer in front of that, mm -hmm. and so all the command line actually go in through the API, and Inside IQ goes in through the API. So the API is kind of the, the first kind of entry point into the operating system, everyone uses it, and now it's available to the public to use as well. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, part of this statistics per conversation is the presentation piece, and, and as David was talking about, it's the difference in terms of uh, the way that we structured the API. You know, once we came to Riptide, which was 8.0 that released at the beginning of this year, kind of the management model is owned by the API layer. Um, so the API layer is what we call Pappy, and it's the way that, for instance, Inside IQ gets all of its data and everything else. And then on top of that is scaffolded the abstraction of the CLI, and on top of that is scaffolded, not on top of the CLI, but on top of the API is <coughs> scaffolded all of the UI presentation, whether or not it be Inside IQ or the UX itself. So that means that from a cloud automation perspective, you can interface to Pappy and basically do all of the operations that you might be able to do through any other interface <laughs> on the Riptide uh, code base and beyond. But I did want to take one uh, minor diversion. You know, David has now talked about two really important things, both the NDU and the partition performance stuff. I call it partition performance. They called it something else, performance resource management. Inside of engineering, uh, we've been tracking it for the last three or four years as partition performance. Um, and these are two things that are very different uh, from a scale up perspective to a distributed systems perspective. Uh, uh, you know, when you think from a distributed systems standpoint on that NDU and that NDO conversation, underneath the covers, a ton of stuff had to be done to basically assert the, the uh, uh, value prop of rolling upgrades forever uh, to the endpoints. It means that across the cluster, all of the interfaces 
our version controlled on all of the IPCs and all of the backend traffic, all of the RBM traffic that we do over that backend network, and all of the management plane, because the cluster actually knows how to run a different version of the distributed system uh, on two different versions and knows how to be able to then uh, uh, through a state machine, enable more and more of the functionalities uh, 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 as uh, all of the cluster nodes are coherently at the same revision. So it's really a distributed system that knows how to run two full different versions of the on-disk conversation, two full different versions of the control plane conversation, and be able to roll back to the previous one if you want to. From a distributed systems complexity standpoint, it's a pretty difficult thing. Um, and that's why it was really the, uh, one of the big harbingers of what we brought in in 8.0. Underneath the covers, partition performance was the same thing. Think about it. What we're really talking about is tracking a set of uh, client conversations coming in on one terminus node and figuring out all the dependent IOs because of all of the metadata traffic and all of the data traffic that might be done by that specific initiation and the queuing of all of those things across all of the nodes that are participating in delivering that IO stream. All of that dynamic real-time correlation event stuff is now tracked across the system so that what you're really looking at when you look at partition performance, whether or not you're looking at it through Grafana, whether or not you're looking at it through any of the other dashboards that we support, you're looking at a cluster top. Uh, even though we don't kind of really call it cluster top. It tells you real time SMB is consuming this CAS eviction rate out of L2, out of L3. This is what the IO profile of this particular workflow is from a SMB or from an NFS perspective on the back end disks. To the question tying it together to the network question around rebuild, you can now look at all the internal cluster jobs and you know, hey, I have a protection event that's happening on this particular drive. It's consuming this amount of cluster CPU across the cluster at this exact moment in time. This amount of memory, this amount of cache eviction creating these disk IOs with this disk IO profile. And what we're doing as we continue to mature that is changing the granularity of the bucket that you can track there and also starting to introduce controls around those things so you can go in and do really cool prioritization across those things saying I want the cluster to be focused on this or I want the cluster to be fo <clears throat> focused on that. So underneath the covers from a distributed systems standpoint, partition performance is a big deal um, because what it really did is it created the whole string of pearls kind of tracking mechanism to take MBUF conversations all the way at the top of the business or at the top of the, uh, the node that's coming in and be able to track it in terms of all of the dependent IO that might be generated for that workflow. So, you know, underneath the covers, this is a harbinger of a ton of technology that will continue to come out in this space um, around uh, kind of being able to change the conversation on the cluster into speaking about the workflows that the cluster is running, not necessarily the artifacts that the cluster is tracking because of those workflows, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically it's, it's pretty hard to do in a distributed system. In a controller-based system, we have basically one controller that controls the entire volume or file system. Well, that controller knows everything about that file system. And in a 100-node cluster, being able to aggregate all of that information across all of the 100 nodes and say, okay, I can now present it for a file that's potentially distributed across you know, maybe 20 nodes is a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, so I really appreciate kind of the efforts of engineering here to go pull that together. It's really uh, a pretty fantastic feature that you know, not many scale-out systems will be able to replicate very easily.